Praise be Jesus and Mary. I'm David Rodriguez, content director of the Fatima Center, and we're building on a firm foundation as we study the basics of our Catholic faith. In the last episode, we explained the heresy of indifferentism. Today, we're going to do something that's even more important, and that's go over papal teaching against this grave error so that you can be convinced yourself that this is the teaching that comes from the vicars of Christ, that comes from our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Uh, that does obviously require faith. And so we'll begin this session as we do the others with the act of faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Oh my God, I firmly believe that thou art one God in three divine persons the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I believe that thy divine Son became man and died for our sins, and that he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe these and all the truths which the Holy Catholic Church teaches, because thou hast revealed them, who canst neither deceive nor be deceived. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. As I mentioned last time, a whole series of popes, nine consecutive popes from the 1820s up until the 1950s, were consistently teaching against this heresy of religious indifferentism. Uh, nothing can really replace reading what the popes themselves have taught, because then you're going to see how clear their teaching is, how emphatic how strong, how consistent, how authoritative, ultimately, how this is an infallible teaching. Uh, now, unfortunately, what that also does is that puts us in a difficult situation as Catholics living today in 2020 because we realize that the popes of today are not saying the same thing. Uh, our bishops oftentimes and our priests oftentimes are not saying the same things that the church has always taught. Uh, we might also put a resource up on the website where we even have scriptural teachings from our Lord and the Apostles and numerous church doctors and church saints and councils that also teach this teaching. Uh, so it's not just these nine popes that I've listed up on the screen and their encyclicals, and it's not just in those places. I mean, those popes taught them in many, many other places. So there's many, many citations. This is the perennial teaching of the church. What we present here today in these brief 15 minutes is really just a sampling of some of the papal teaching. But as I said, it puts us in a difficult bind because you realize that um, th there has been a deviation from it. This is one of the reasons why there's such a grave crisis in the church. And you realize that it's not so much that this or that person might oppose what uh, a current prelate is teaching because that person might in fact be wanting to stand in continuity with the perennial teaching of the church. And if, in fact, you stand with what a current prelate is teaching, then that might put you in conflict with the perennial teaching of the church. Uh, and, and that's a very difficult situation to be in, but that is the nature of the crisis today. Uh, and that makes it really difficult for Catholics, uh, because we certainly want to be faithful to Christ, we certainly want to be faithful to our prelates, uh, but if past popes are themselves, um, I should say, if the if the current sort of popes and bishops or some of the current magisterium on an important point of doctrine places themselves in conflict with the previous magisterial teaching, uh, then it doesn't matter which way you go, you're going to be in conflict with some of them. And we have to stand with the perennial teaching of the church, what Christ has always taught. And as I said, this is one of the grave signs, one of the very clear and strong and powerful signs of the grave crisis in the church that exists today, this grave crisis of faith, this diabolical disorientation that has gripped the church. Those are the words that Sister Lucia of Fatima used. And this is why Our Lady of Fatima even came to warn us of these coming great dangers to our faith and hence great dangers to our salvation. Hence also that vision of all the souls that were falling into hell that she gave the children back on July 13th, 1917. Because if the faith is attacked, and the faith is lost, or the faith is changed, or if everybody adopts this heresy of indifferentism, 
then yes, it's going to be a very, very serious problem for our salvation. Uh, and this is where we have to do a lot of prayer and penance. So this is how this really does connect uh, very clearly with the message of Fatima. Uh, and why papal teaching is so important. As you know, the message of Fatima deals with uh, the person and the role and the office of the papacy uh, like no other uh, private revelation, public uh, Marian revelation uh, really ever has. So the first one we'll look at is Pope Leo XIII. Uh, again, you can download these from the website and you can read them along with me or see them here on your screen, uh, the parts that we can show. So Pope Leo XIII reigned from 1823 to 1829 in his document Ubi Primum, I'll be quoting from paragraph number 12 where the Pope writes, A certain sect has unjustly arrogated to itself the name of philosophy, and has aroused from ashes the disorderly ranks of practically every error. Under the gentle appearance of piety and liberality, this sect professes what they call tolerance or indifferentism. It preaches that God has given every individual a wide freedom to embrace and to adopt, without danger to his salvation, whatever sect or opinion appeals to him on the basis of his private judgment. The Apostle Paul warns us against the impiety of these madmen. So here you see the definition of indifferentism and its impiety, and these are madmen. Although it's been around for a while, that's why they're resurrecting it from the ashes where it had been destroyed. In verse, in verse, in paragraph 13, uh, Pope Leo XII continues, Of course this error is not new. This indifferentism seemed absurd to St. Augustine, and rightly so. But in his day, at least it did acknowledge some limits. But a tolerance which extends to deism and naturalism, which even the ancient heretics rejected, can never be approved by anyone who uses his reason. Nevertheless, alas for the times, alas for this lying philosophy, such a tolerance is approved, defended, and praised by these pseudo-philosophers. So it's this deism, this naturalism, that leads us to this religious indifferentism. Um, those are grave errors. That's this false philosophy, a, a deism and a naturalism uh, that does not need a body of doctrine and just tells you you can believe naturally in whatever God and however God you want to believe in. He reminds us just in virtue 19, notice how emphatic he is, in virtue of our apostolic office. We too exhort you, he's talking to the bishops, to try every means of keeping your flock from those deadly pastures, the deadly pastures of religious indifferentism. So that's Ubi Primum. Again, you can look all these documents up online. Uh, also, if you want, you can get a great book. I like this book. It's called The Popes Against Modern Errors. Uh, but really, all it is is it's a collection of a number of encyclicals that the one who compiled this book put together. Uh, there's certainly more papal encyclicals throughout this time, uh, but a number of the encyclicals that speak against religious indifferentism are in this book. And as I said, though, you can get them online as well. PapalEncyclicals.net is a great website that has a lot of those documents. Uh, the Vatican's website often has these documents as well. Okay, next, uh, one of my favorite documents, I would really encourage you to read it because it's short, and as you read it, you'll think, wow, it's like Pope Gregory XVI, who was reigning from 1831 to 1846. It's almost like he's alive right now, and he's talking to us and addressing the problems of our time. Uh, but here's what he says, Pope Gregory, in paragraph 13 of that document, Mirari Vos. Now we consider another abundant source of the evils with which the church is afflicted at present in differentism. This perverse opinion is spread on all sides by the fraud of the wicked, who claim that it is possible to obtain the eternal salvation of the soul by the profession of any kind of religion, so long as morality is maintained. Surely, in so clear a matter, you will drive this deadly error far from the people committed to your care. With the admonition of the apostle, that there is one God, one faith, one baptism. May those who contrive the notion that the safe harbor of salvation is open to persons of any religion, whatever, they should consider the testimony of Christ himself, that those who are not with Christ are against him, and that they disperse unhappily who do not gather with him. Therefore, without a doubt, 
they will perish forever unless they hold the Catholic faith whole and inviolate. And so there you can see that the Pope is quoting Ephesians chapter 4. He's also quoting the Athanasian Creed, things that we've already covered in our discussions on the virtue of faith. In, verse 14, in paragraph 14, the Pope goes on and says, This shameful font of indifferentism gives rise to the absurd and erroneous proposition which claims that liberty of conscience must be maintained for everyone. It spreads ruin in sacred and civil affairs. Yet it is a pestilence more deadly to the state than any other. So this pestilence is going to spread ruin in our families, in our communities, in our state, our civil society, and in the church. That is what the popes consistently teach. And there's great logic to what they say. Again, go back and read those papal encyclicals. I really exhort you to do that because uh, what you see is that they're diagnosing the problem and then they're also saying, if you follow the problem, this is what's going to happen to society. This is where this leads. And so in that sense, they were quote-unquote prophetic, not that they could foretell the future by some supernatural power, just seeing the natural end of these errors, they could see what it was going to do to society. And now, today, we're living in it. And so you know their words are true, even just by your own experience, because you look out in the world and you say, wow, everything they said is going to happen has happened, and worse, uh, because we didn't heed their admonitions. Because the world at large and the Catholic faithful at large have not heeded their teachings, our Lord Jesus Christ in His great mercy was giving us the salvific truth we need through the teaching of His own vicars, the popes. Uh, and by and large, they've been disregarded. Uh, people don't read this. People don't follow this. And so we're in the errors that they themselves told us we would get into. It's like the proof is in the, the, proof is in the pudding. Now uh, you read their documents and you say, wow, that, that's one of the things that really opened my eyes. And one of the things that really, you know, sort of saddens me and disappoints me at times is that even uh, those who are studying towards the priesthood, who are in our seminaries, even very often in traditional seminaries, they don't even read these papal documents. And I think to myself, that's crazy. These popes uh, diagnose the error of our times and by God's grace have given us the antidote for the problems of our times, and yet we're not reading and following their teachings. Okay, uh, but it continues, for example, Pope Pius IX. I mean, he taught it time and time again. Um, in Quanto Conficiamor, an encyclical he wrote to the Italian bishops in 1863, we should mention again and censure a very grave error in which some Catholics are unhappily engaged, who believe that men living in error and separated from the true faith and from Catholic unity can attain eternal life. Indeed, this is certainly quite contrary to Catholic teaching. You can find that quote in Denzinger, 1677. And then the Pope, Pius IX, goes on in his Syllabus of Errors. You've probably heard of that document. Uh, it's a very important document, uh, which he wrote. Uh, people often, though, forget that it came with a cover letter. So the cover letter is Quanta Cura. And you can read Quanta Cura, because in Quanta Cura, paragraph number six, you see very clearly that what the Pope is doing is he's teaching this at the level of infallibility. Uh, I've heard many people claim that the Syllabus of Errors is not infallible. That is false. Uh, read it in context. It came with Quanta Cura, and Quanta Cura number six lays it out very clearly there. He has every intention to be teaching infallibly and saying that every Catholic must hold this. And then what he does in the Syllabus of Errors is he lists propositions, propositions that are false. He's saying, you cannot believe this. If you believe this, you are in grave error. Uh, and if you do this willfully and knowingly, you know, you're putting yourself outside the Catholic faith because you're not holding all the dogmas of the faith. And so I'm going to list four of them, numbers 15, 16, 17, and 18, which deal with this heresy. Again, these are propositions that are false. One cannot hold them. Um, do you sometimes uh, think this way? Are you tempted to hold this way? Pope Pius IX is infallibly teaching a Catholic may not. Number 15. Every man is free to embrace and profess that religion which guided, by the light, which, guided by the light of reason, he shall consider true. That's false. Number 16. Man may, in the observance of any religion whatever, find the way of eternal salvation and arrive at eternal salvation. False. Heresy against the Catholic faith. Number 17. Good hope at least is to be entertained of the eternal salvation of those who are not at all in the true Church of Christ. That too is false. Good hope at least is to be entertained. That is false. Number 18. 
Protestantism is nothing more than another form of the same true Christian religion in which form it is given to please God equally as in the Catholic Church. That too is false. And here again you have the popes teaching it themselves. Pope Leo XIII made a couple of great documents. I won't even quote from them right now, uh, but Libertas Prestantissimum on the nature of true liberty in 1888. It's a good read, as well as Immortale Dei from 1885. That's his encyclical on the Christian constitution of states. Uh, both of those are very good and will address this topic of indifferentism. Pope Leo had to keep going back to it. But also from Humanum Genus. This is number 16. This is document against Freemasonry. Uh, and it's evil. So he's talking about the Freemasons. He says, first, and this is paragraph 16, first, in this way, the Freemasons easily deceive the simple-minded and the heedless, and they can induce a far greater number to become members. Again, as all who offer themselves are received, whatever may be their form of religion, and thereby they teach the great error of this age, that a regard for religion should be held as an indifferent matter, and that all religions are alike. This manner of reasoning is calculated to bring about the ruin of all forms of religion, and especially of the Catholic religion, which, as it is the only one that is true, cannot, without great injustice, be regarded as merely equal to other religions. So he's explaining how this is one of the great errors of Freemasonry, that it tells everyone, oh, you can join this sect and you can join this group and it doesn't matter what you believe because, you know, we're all indifferent and we're all tolerant. And he says that brings about the destruction of religion. That brings about the destruction of the Catholic religion, which is the one true faith. Going on, for example, Pope Pius X, he also taught against this very often, but I'll quote a little bit from On the Sion, uh, our apostolic mandate is this document. There was a movement in France in the early 1900s where they were trying to unite uh, workers to fight for social justice. Uh, it started out as Christian Catholic action, uh, but then leaned into communism and Marxism and really just socialism. Uh, and so the Pope had to condemn it after it sort of started out well. And part of the reason he had to condemn it and part of the reason it went awry and it became a force against good and against God is because it adopted this religious indifferentism. So Pope Pius X explains it uh, and its dangers. And as you read that document, you're like, whoa, he's talking about our times as well and even what's going on in our world right now. So we'll read a few paragraphs from On the Sion, this document by Pius X. Here's what he writes, paragraph 36. Here we have, founded by Catholics, an interdenominational association, that is, to work for the reform of civilization, an undertaking which is above all religious in character, for there is no true civilization without a moral civilization, and no true moral civilization without true religion. It is a proven truth, a historical fact. Then in paragraph 38 he says, But stranger still, alarming and saddening at the same time, are the audacity and frivolity of men who call themselves Catholics and dream of reshaping society under such conditions and of establishing on earth, over and beyond the pale of the Catholic Church, the reign of love and justice, with workers coming from everywhere, of all religions and of no religion, with or without beliefs, so long as they forego what might divide them their religious and philosophical convictions, and as long as they share in what unites them. It will be a tumultuous agitation, sterile for the end proposed, but which will benefit the less utopian exploiters of the people. Yes, we can truly say that the Sion, its eyes fixed on a chimera, brings socialism in its train, brings Marxism and brings communism, Things which are incompatible with the Catholic faith. Uh, that last little bit right there was my uh, addition when he talks about socialism. Going back to the words of Pius X, number 40. This is why it's good for you to read them and for, or follow along uh, in the handout so you know exactly what the popes are saying. In, in paragraph number 40, uh, this is what Pope Pius X says, quote, The great movement of apostasy being organized in every country for the establishment of a one-world church which shall have neither dogmas, nor hierarchy, neither discipline for the mind, nor curb the passions, 
and which, under the pretext of freedom and human dignity, would bring back to the world, if such a church could overcome, the reign of legalized cunning and force, and the oppression of the weak and of all those who toil and suffer. So he's saying this religious indifferentism is ultimately leading us to a one world religion that has no dogmas, no hierarchy, uh, no discipline for the mind, doesn't curb the passions, and the pretext is human freedom and human dignity. How often have you heard that? And instead that's going to bring back to the world a form that is even worse than paganism, more tyrannical, legalized cunning, legalized force that oppresses all people. I see that developing all around me. I hope you do as well. And this is why it's so important to read what the popes say. Uh, last document I'll look at, and again, this one is so important. I really encourage you to read this one. Uh, it is Mortalium Animus by Pope Pius XI, written back in 1929, I believe. And he is explaining uh, why uh, this ecumenical movement is false. Okay, why the ecumenical movement can never be participated in by Catholics. So here's what he says in paragraph number two, Pius XI. Certainly such attempts, these ecumenical attempts, can no wise be approved by Catholics, founded as they are on the false opinion, which considers all religions to be more or less good or praiseworthy, since they are all in different ways manifest and signify that sense which is inborn in us all, and by which we are all led to God and to the obedient acknowledgement of his rule. Okay, that's the mistake. Not only are those who hold this opinion in error and deceived, but also in distorting the idea of true religion, they reject it, and little by little turn aside to naturalism and atheism, as it is called, from which it clearly follows that one who supports those who hold these theories and attempt to realize them altogether abandon the divinely revealed religion. So he's saying, look, these errors of religious indifferentism, they lead to naturalism. They lead to atheism. And anyone who embraces this, this false ecumenical movement, as if dogma doesn't matter, is abandoning the divinely revealed religion, is abandoning Christ, is abandoning his church. <laughs> the popes themselves are telling us this. All the things that we said earlier, go back. It's in the papal teaching. He continues in paragraph 3, but some are more easily deceived by the outward appearance of good when there is question of fostering unity among Christians. So he's explaining, look, unity among Christians is a good thing. And we all know that, and we all recognize that, and we all want that. And that's how some get deceived, because of this outward appearance of a good. But see, the internal thing is evil because it's false, this religious indifference. So you've got to achieve Christian unity the right way, which he'll go on and explain in that document. Uh, so for example, in paragraph 9, Pius, 9th, Pius 11th writes, this being so, it is clear that the apostolic see, the Pope, cannot on any terms take part in their assemblies, nor is it any way lawful for Catholics either to support or to work for such enterprises. For if they do so, they will be giving countenance to a false Christianity quite alien to the one church of Christ. So he's explaining how they're having these gatherings, these world prayer gatherings, and leaders from different religions are gathering together in assemblies, and they actually extend the invitation of the Pope. And the Pope says, in no way could I ever go. The Apostolic See can't participate in these ecumenical assemblies, these prayer gatherings, and neither can any Catholic, because if you do so, you give false, you give countenance, uh, you give countenance to a false Christianity, which is alien to Christ and to his church. This is what Pius XI is teaching. If only teaching was this clear today. And then in paragraph 15, writing to the bishops, he says, So, venerable brethren, it is clear why this apostolic see has never allowed, never allowed, its subjects to take part in the assemblies of non-Catholics. For the union of Christians can only be promoted by promoting the return to the one true church of Christ of those who are separated from it. For in the past they have unhappily left it. To the one true church of Christ, we say, which is visible to all, and which is to remain according to the will of its author exactly the same as he instituted it. 
So the church doesn't change. It's one holy Catholic, Catholic and apostolic. The faith does not change. And he's saying the only way to bring about Christian unity is to encourage all to come back to the one Catholic church. And this is why the apostolic see has never allowed us to take part in the assemblies of non-Catholics. This is perennial Catholic teaching, which you will find over and over again throughout the teaching of the popes. Um, please do read these documents. Go back and see what the popes have taught. Because again, as I said, in his goodness, in his mercy, God gave us the antidote for this great error of our times, but we are blindly ignoring it, and we cannot do that anymore. We need to learn the truth of the faith, and then if it's difficult to accept, we talked about why it's difficult last time, you need to pray to God for that faith. We get on our knees and we beg God, give us this faith, because I want to love you above all things, and I want to place my faith in you. Um, and then, I mean, the, the popes keep teaching this. I mean, I could quote to you from Umani Genesis, of Pius XII, paragraph number 27. I could quote to you various other passages, um, but look up those notes, please. We do put them up on our website as helpful resources. Uh, take advantage of these things. As I said, l learn that Catholic faith and pray to God for an increase in faith because it is so absolutely important uh, for your salvation, the salvation of your loved ones, uh, so that you can gain greater merit and help uh, obey the message that Our Lady brought to us at Fatima. I mean, we need that for our times. If you have any questions on these topics, please do give us a call. Uh, you can call the number that's up on the screen. You could also email me at info at fatima.org. Uh, our number is 1-800-263-8160. I uh, ask you to continue to keep us in your prayers and to, uh, if at all possible, uh, you know, make greater penances and greater reparation uh, so that we will all have uh, the true Catholic faith, and there will be unity uh, among all Christians and among all people in that one Catholic faith. That's so important. So, so do more penances and prayers for that, uh, as well as please continue to support us uh, through your donations. We greatly appreciate the donations that have been sent. We continue to need those. Uh, let's go ahead and close with a Hail Mary, because Our Lady smashes and destroys all heresies. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. Sweetheart of Mary, be my salvation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. May God bless you and your families and grant you always an increase in the virtue of faith. <laughs>